Are those the Sharpies? Permanent. Permanent. Dry erase. All right. I've made this mistake way too many times to do it again. <laughs> Okay, and we're recording, but who cares? I'll cut out whatever we need after. So, to introduce Stephen Isaac. Yeah. Got it in one. Thank you, thank you. It's all about me. Uh, okay, presentation over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can all go home. Uh, he's awesome. He's a Skull Space member recently, I believe. Ish. Kind several of, months, yeah. maybe. I don't know. He occasionally gives us presentations, which is why we love him, because so few people give presentations. So you people should get presentations. End of pitch. Your turn. Awesome. All right. Uh, yes, I am who Max said I was. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, a fairly important paper in the topic of computer vision called uh, Object Recognition from Local Scale Invariant Features by David Lowe. Um, if you've ever heard the term SIFT before, this is where it comes from. Uh, so let's begin. What is image processing? Well, basically image processing is processing images. What more do you want? Uh, it's analysis and modification of digital images to some particular end. It's considered an offshoot of digital signal processing, which is how we just process any kind of a discrete sig signal that we have in our computer, so any kind of audio or radio transmission, things like that. Images are really no different, and we use a lot of the same techniques to do so. Uh, yeah, just some sequence over a domain. Usually it's time if you're thinking about an audio signal or something, but for images it's signal over space. But really it's just a function over something. So it's not that much different. Uh, yeah, and you can even extend this to three dimensions if you want to think of a video as being over space and time. Really the basic bits that you need to know. but. Why is that important? Why do we care about what image processing? Well, it's because we use images a lot. And not just for looking at cats on the internet, though mostly for looking at cats on the internet. But it's an important topic. Um, in particular, what I'm going to be talking about today is object recognition, or the subclass of stuff surrounding recognizing things in images automatically. So, sort of take a look at that image there. There is a cat embedded somewhere in there. There's a lot of cats in this presentation, by the way. Uh, but it's kind of hard to tell. So the question is, how would one identify that kind of an object automatically? It doesn't seem obvious because the color palette is similar there. It's, it's a tough problem to solve. But really, the way that we're going to phrase it is it's basically a searching problem, the same way that you're going to search through an array for a particular item. Basically the same idea. Uh, Another way we can. Where the cat is? Huh? Oh, it's edge detected. Right there. And then there's an enlarged picture of the cat. Oh, it's white. It's a white cat. Right there. Oh shit, that's really tiny. Yeah. It's a hard problem, but of course, you as a kid may have known this as the problem of where's Waldo. Pretty much that for computers. Uh, what do we use it for? Well, aside from sort of the obvious things like, say, automatic facial recognition, uh, optical character re registration recognition, and the you know stepping stones onto our inevitable decline to our robot overlords, uh, we also use it a lot for image stitching, which is a very important application where you take a bunch of images and then you try to overlay them together to form a smooth panorama. Um, the trick to doing so is you try to find a common object in the images between them and then just kind of like rotate and paste them onto each other and it makes a nice seamless little thing. And that's nice, it's really useful because then you can use your phone to take a big nice 360 panorama when you go hiking in the mountains or something. I don't know. It's fun stuff to use it for. Um, and my computer froze. Yes, all right. Uh, the other fun thing that it's used for is something called structure from motion, which uh, is an interesting way of deriving three-dimensional information from just a bunch of two-dimensional images. You may know this from what Google Street View does to make things look more three-dimensional than they would seem. Uh, this is just the Google Street View of outside there, and this was formed by just pasting together a bunch of images. and. When you use Google Street View, you actually sort of get a 3D 
feel for the buildings around there. They didn't actually model those 3D buildings directly. They just took the images and they sort of coalesced them together in a way similar that animals do through their stereoscopic vision. Like it's how we're able to detect depth as well. Computers can just sort of do it on a larger scale with enough coaxing. So, yeah, and my slides are messed up apparently. Uh, so, I want to overview um, David Lowe's SIFT method, algorithm, paper, whatever you want to call it, and uh, it's a, what we call a feature-based object recognition method. I'll get into what that is and why that's important later. Um, and it was a really important paper at the time because I guess it was sort of the first example of somebody really solving all of the problems associated with computer object recognition at once in a really good systematic way instead of just kind of throwing things at the wall and hoping they stick. Um, and as a result, it's pretty much kind of the de facto standard for this type of problem even to this day, even though there's quote unquote better or faster algorithms out there, people will still always compare back to SIFT because it's just the, the big one. Uh, but before that, I'm not quite sure exactly the kind of background everybody has here in image processing, so I'm going to kind of do a bit of an overview of that beforehand. If you already know it, feel free to fall asleep, I won't be offended, but if not, maybe you'll learn something, who knows. And also, I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth on why object recognition is so hard. Like, we know it's hard, but specifically why it's hard and identifying exact reasoning, I think is kind of how uh, David Lowe was able to get to a good solution. So it's a good idea to look at a problem systematically in that way. So start with an overview. How, else, how do we gonna process images? Well, the answer, of course, is by using math. Yes. Um, <laughs> like I said, image processing is a branch of discrete signal processing or digital signal processing. I'm never actually sure what that acronym is. It could be both. Um, and usually when you think of DSP, you think of it as sort of some kind of a bar and line chart where one dimension is some piece of data, temperature, sound, I don't know, the other one is time. And like I said, images are going to be just a two variable function over space, but really we can just think of them as a function. They're not really continuous, but we can kind of fudge it by interpolating and applying some weird tricks. So really it's just a function. It makes things a little bit harder since it's not, so not a nice one variable function. We need to use two variables, but the basic concepts are still the same. And as a result, we can do what we normally do to functions. So we can, you know, apply statistical methods, we can find out different bits and pieces of information we like, you know, mean, median, we can try developing a model, some kind of expected result, doing some kind of machine learning statistical understanding of things. We also do lots of calculus, uh, and in this case it's going to be, of course, multivariable calculus, um, because it's over two variables, so you can take the derivative of an image, which seems kind of weird, but it works. Um, and various other bits and pieces of analysis. Uh, there's also harmonic analysis. This means analysis of periodic elements, so like wave e type things. This comes into play when you're analyzing images with like checkerboard patterns or like corduroy striped patterns and things, trying to identify that as a unit rather than a bunch of discrete things. Uh, so if you ever heard of the term Fourier transform, this is kind of where it comes in. And linear algebra, we build things, we rotate them, we shift them, we transform them, all kinds of fun stuff like that. And if it seems like it's just a hodgepodge of a bunch of crap, it's because it is. There really is no one specific thing to it. You have to kind of draw in all your knowledge to solve these problems, and usually you kind of just fudge it with the best you can. So let's begin with the sort of building block, let's say, of image processing, which is called a convolution filter. Um, what it is, is it's a functional transformation. So it's a function where you take your image, which is also a function, and you get out another image, also a function. So you take your image and you just transform the whole thing into something else, something different, something that was derived from the image, but it gives you something that you want. Well, what do we want usually with an image? Uh, usually we have one of two goals. We either want to accentuate something important in the image, so we would call this uh, augmenting the signal of the image, the actual content we want, 
Or alternatively, we also want to suppress the stuff in the image we don't want, the noise, let's say. Um, and usually, filters take one of these two forms. Sometimes filters are used for one in one context and another in another, but it's the basic idea of what you want out of this kind of a filter. So for kind of a pictorial example here, uh, what we're going to do is what we take sort of an anchor point, one pixel on the image, and then we take a sample or rectangle around that. Um, so here it's just going to be a simple three by three filter where we take the nine pixels sort of centered around that 193 over there. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply it by a rectangle of the same size component wise. So we're going to multiply each element by one over nine because there's nine of them. Sum them all together and then put it back in that exact same position. And the net result that we get is we get an averaging blur. We just take the average of the neighborhood around each pixel and it makes the image look a little blurry, not very clear because it's a projector and so there's no uh, sharpness to it. But if you were looking at it on this screen, you'd see that it's just slightly blurrier. And if we made the filter wider, we would get even more blur. We could apply it multiple times to get an even blurrier and blurrier image. And by itself, this kind of a blurring filter isn't that useful. The one that is, is called Gaussian blur, where the idea is that you use a Gaussian or a bell curve distribution for your rectangle of numbers to multiply things for. Um, and the idea here is that the pixel in the center is the most important one, and that's the peak of your curve, and that weights the most into what your output is, but you kind of take in the neighbors a little bit. And Gaussian blur tends to actually give really good smoothing. It's pretty much the go-to way of applying smoothing in an image. So maybe it's clear that one's a little bit blurry. That was just an example of passing it over with a fairly small but still significant Gaussian function and just kind of softens it up and makes it look all kind of dreamlike. Uh, in particular, what we use it for is for filtering out noise um, because it sort of smooths out bits and pieces, weird errant pixels, kind of get washed over and we get a nicer image even if it is a little bit less sharp. Another kind of filter that we use uh, is called the Sobel filter and uh, the purpose of it is to provide an approximation of the gradient. And for those of you who can't remember your uh, multivariable calculus, gradient is the multidimensional derivative of a function. So in this case it's the two-dimensional derivative, so the change of the image in the x direction and in the y direction. And if it seems weird that you can compute it, it is, but it's really useful. Um, and so yeah, it's a vector valued uh, thing. You'll actually get two images, one of the x derivatives and one of the y derivatives, and then you can take them and compute the magnitude of the change in that point in the image. Um, and yeah, it's, it expresses rate of change in an image, but what is rate of change in an image if not an edge in the image? When you have an edge, it changes colors from one thing to another. So as a result, we use this for detecting edges in images. Uh, so here's an example of taking this image and then applying an X filter. And so you kind of get a weird relief view of it where you can see how the image changes as X changes. And likewise, you can do it in Y. And then you can combine them together to kind of get a rough view of what edges look like in the image. Um, so this is an example of data that's there but it's kind of hard to see in its raw state, which is why we need this kind of a filter which augments the signal, the actual data we want to be looking at. Um, this is another uh, edge detecting filter called Laplacian. I just wanted to toss it in there because if you actually want to look for edges, usually you use, uh, well, you usually use a combination of both. Like I said, you've got to fudge it with whatever tools you have, but this one sort of gives you a nicer view of things. But moral of the story is that this is sort of the basis of the kind of image processing algorithms that you'll be doing, which is trying to get a starting point on what you're looking for. Uh, so now that we have a little bit of a background on the kinds of stuff we're going to be doing with images, let's get back to our topic at hand. Given a target image, some kind of a template, we want to find that image in another image. So here we have a book and there's another book there. And how do we get a computer to tell you that, yes, that book is there and where is it? Um, you know, it's a pretty easy thing to do for most humans. Unfortunately for computers, it's a little bit more difficult. Why is it so difficult? 
Uh, the biggest problem is that there's a large search space involved. Um, images are big. They have to be big because in order to get enough resolution for them to appear seamless, they need to be enormous, the giant grid of pixels. And if you're trying to find a specific template in an image, it starts to get a little infeasible trying to like pass through matching every single rectangle. But even worse than that, as in the previous example, there's more degrees of freedom than just where it is in the image. You also have to take into account the rotation of the object in the image. You have to take into account the scale of the object, whether you're closer or farther away from the object than it is in the template. And furthermore, um, lighting can be an issue because lighting determines what the color of the object will be. And if the lighting conditions are different from the template to the actual scene that the uh, object is embedded in, then you can't match colors very well. Um, beyond that, it's, it's an interesting problem because if you do it poorly, it's one of the rare examples of a brute force approach, a human will win every time over a computer. So even though an image is mostly blank information, and as a human it would be very easy for you to process it almost instantly, a computer could probably take a long time processing that same information if you didn't do it intelligently. Furthermore, there's also a lot of extraneous information in images typically. Like you have the one thing you're looking for and then a billion other things surrounding it. How do you isolate and pick out that one thing? And then finally, the actual object that you're looking for might not even be fully present in the image. It might be blocked by something. Um, so you can't just match it sort of pixel for pixel from your template. You have to take into account things being in the way, things being lost, things being slightly ruffled, whatever the case may be. So, as a result, as we can probably guess from what I'm trying to get here, brute force is not a good approach. Um, it's slow, and even before you take into account having to transform the object in some way, and it really doesn't even work that well. Um, it doesn't deal with any of the other issues we discussed. So, how are we going to improve on this? Well, when you talk to people who do animation for a living, they usually tell you that the most important part of a character that you're animating is the silhouette or the outline. So, and that's because that's what we as humans in our own vision detect most prominently. So, let's apply this to computers. What if we were to instead take the image and then try to extract just the edges in the image for some definition of edge? There's many different ways of actually extracting edges and you can maybe try a bunch and see what happens, and then only match up the edge pixels. Um, this is a little better and it's a little faster because usually the uh, volume of edge pixels in an image is going to be linear in the dimensions rather than quadratic, so it speeds things up. Um, and yeah, you can usually apply certain optimizations to only compare to edge pixels. It's a little bit better. Um, Still not great. It um, still doesn't deal with obstructions very well. It's still kind of slow, and edges are kind of finicky because identifying something as an edge of an object versus an edge inside the object is really, really tricky, and humans can do it quite well. Computers, not so much. Taking a step further, well, if edges don't work, let's go even smaller in the dimensional scale and go to just the corners. Um, so, just trying to pick out points and edges that where the curvature changes abruptly. Um, and this method actually works fairly well. Um, it's a little bit more robust to having obstructions in the way. So here I just kind of picked out a couple corners. And as, if you might imagine, you try and kind of line up clusters of points together to figure out what's happening. And the advantage to here is that even if a bunch of points are missing uh, in one of the other, the, either the template or in the scene, you can usually kind of line enough of them up that you can get a rough guess of what you're actually looking for. So this is getting towards what we need. And the moral of the story here is that most of the data in the image is useless. What we want to do is we want to focus on the important bits of the images. When it, when it comes to like processing images in this way, less tends to be more. So let's solve the problem. We have three main barriers. There's too much data, most of it is useless, and the useful stuff, some of it might be missing. So how are we going to do this? We are going to extract features from the image, specific points in the image that look really distinct. Um, 
And the important part about these features is that we want them to be recognizable even when they've been transformed in some way. So uh, rotated, scaled, under different lighting, all those different things. We want to get the biggest bang for your buck out of each bit of the image that we are looking over. So that brings us to the SIF, Scale Invariant Feature Transform. Uh, so this was a 1999 paper by David Lowe at uh, University of BC. Uh, the journal version was published in 2004, so if you're actually really interested in this, I'd recommend looking over that one because it's a more thorough examination of the topic. Um, it's not the first example of using features for object recognition. If you consider corners, could be considered a feature of the object. But it was kind of the first to get really, really, really good results in this domain. And I think it's because you really systematically solved the problem by identifying what the main barriers were. Uh, so SIFTs are very robust. They don't, uh, they respond well to having obstructions in the way or kind of weirdness in the image. They're an extremely efficient way of locating features and they are very effective. They work extremely well, surprisingly well in a lot of cases. And I think probably the bigger takeaway from this is that it kind of formed a good framework for object recognition where you can kind of mix and match pieces like SIFT is the specific methods that he used but you can imagine swapping out different bits and pieces of this algorithm to get different results under different conditions and experimenting with it and seeing what works. Uh, so really, really important piece of work. So a basic outline of this methodology um, the first step is to take your image and to find key points in the image. So these are our points that are the most interesting, so to speak, in the image. Um, we'll call this key localization. Um, and yeah, the important thing is to find points that make good features. And we'll discuss how we do that in just a moment. Uh, the next step here is we need to create a description of that point. So once we have a key point in the image, we need to describe it somehow in a way that works for a computer. Um, the description ideally will be small and we'll take into account the things that we were talking about. So invariant to scale rotation and illumination problems. Uh, and then once we have that small image description, we need to be able to compare it to other key point descriptions really quickly. So given one key point, I want to say, is this the same feature, yes or no, in a really fast way. Uh, so that's kind of the first part of the algorithm, which is kind of building a database of features out of an image. And then the second part is actually performing the matching, where we take a template and a target image and try to line them up in some way. Uh, the first step to it is kind of a coarse-grained cluster identification, it's called, where we kind of get a rough idea, I think the object is over here, and then we run a refinement method over that to kind of solidify it and then decide if that's actually the object we're looking for. Um, and the main point about the second part of this algorithm is that it's really mostly just performance optimizations. Like you could brute force it once you have the features and it would work decently well, but the biggest a big advantage of this method and features in general is because they are so much faster than trying to do things in a naive way. And so you really want to squeeze as much performance as you can out of it. So let's start with step one, key localization. Uh, like I said, we want to find interesting points in the image, mathematically speaking. Uh, in particular, what we're looking for is points that we are going to call stable. Stability basically meaning that we guess that this part of the image will look approximately the same or give us a similar descriptor when it's been transformed in some way. So it's not going to suddenly look completely different if we rotate it a little bit or shift it around a little bit. Um, that's what we mean by stability. And so the manner by which uh, David Lowe suggests that we find such points is difference of Gaussian, which um, the idea is that you take the image and you apply Gaussian smoothing over and over and over and over and over again uh, onto itself until you sort of get a nice smoothing space where you start with your sharp image at one end and just a really blurry blob at the other end. Um, 
and then you take the difference between any two slices of that image and you get the difference of Gaussian and that image difference that you get gives you information about the points and then you use that basically. Um, stop freezing. So yeah, just kind of a pictorial example of what we're doing here. Given an image I, we're gonna blur it and then blur it again and then take the difference of those two. And it's kind of weird because really you're just taking the image minus itself. Like the blurring doesn't change that much in the image. It doesn't actually look that much different from the previous one. And yet the results you get is actually very distinct and it shows you a lot about the image somehow. Um, and so using this, we can actually identify good points to use for our features. Um, and the reason why this sort of works is because when you smooth an image, the idea is that you're removing the high detail, the fine features in the image, and slowly getting more coarse grained features. So as you increase your smoothing, you stop paying attention to the small details and start getting the bigger picture. And the way that this kind of comes together is what we call scale space, where if you periodically downsample the image when we're applying the smoothing, we can get to what we call an image pyramid, where um, you're going to like shrink your image down once it gets a little bit too blurry and you get it in a smaller space. And that's a close approximation to what would actually happen in a visual system if the image were, say, brought further away from you. It would kind of simulate that kind of blurring effect that you would get when something's farther away than when it's close up. Um, and this basically makes our, takes our image from a two-dimensional to a kind of three-dimensional space where we can actually imagine what it would look like at a distance. And that's important because we want scale and variance, right? Um, so if we can describe the image in that extra dimension, we can, yeah, actually get an idea of what it will look like when it's farther away or closer up. Um, so using this difference of Gaussian, where between each of those slices we take the difference, the interesting points are going to be the local minima and maxima in that image. Um, where we compare it to the images sort of at the same level in the pyramid and then above and below it in the pyramid. The details of this aren't necessarily that important. You can read the paper for more details if you really care, but the important thing to note is that what this does is this just isolates the points that we think are most interesting. Um, and then you have to apply further uh, stability constraints. They just use different uh, filters to decide whether the key point is a really, really good one because you only want to pick the best features to move on to the next step of the algorithm. But the main thing is that we are relatively certain that once we've gone through this step, the point that we've identified is a stable key. Um, and then one more point to make about these key points. Once you have a point in the image where we determine an XY location, and we also know at roughly at what level of scale that we found that key point at because we uh, expanded it to a third dimension, so to speak, the last sort of degree of freedom that we want to clamp down on is orientation. Um, and so the trick is that you actually want to state that that key point has some kind of canonical orientation. Um, the way that it does it, it computes the gradient of the nearby pixels, but basically it's just as long as there's a canonical direction that you say this feature is pointed in this direction, you can very efficiently compare other features because they'll also have a canonical direction, which saves a lot on time. This is an example of just a performance optimization in the algorithm. It doesn't necessarily improve correctness, but it's very important to make it go quickly because otherwise you'd have an extra degree of freedom in your search. Um, so yeah, like I said, you just take the gradient of the neighborhood around it and then you put it in kind of a circular histogram. Um, and then you take whichever direction seems the most dominant out of all those vectors that you pulled out of the image and that becomes your canonical direction. It's a fairly straightforward way of doing it and it works, so why not? Um, and it's just a really easy way to save time in the later stage of the algorithm. So now we've described each of the nice points, the interesting points of the image in terms of their location in the image, uh, some kind of a rotation, and the scale. So these are kind of our three, or rather four, because X and Y are two independent parameters, are four parameters that we will describe each feature in our image by. 
Um, then we need to actually describe the location around each of those points. So we have a point in space, so to speak, and now we need to say what is special, what is distinct about that point? How are we going to compare it to other key points? Um, we could, for example, just pick up the color of the image or surrounding a key point and use that as a description. But like I said, that's not very robust to changes in lighting. If the lighting changes, that color is not going to be useful anymore. It turns out what tends to be more robust to changes in lighting is, again, the gradient, which, once again, it's a really important concept in image processing. So even though it would seem weird that you're taking a derivative of an image, it's a really useful descriptor of a part of the image. So you compute the gradient vectors around that key point, and you kind of arrange them into a grid of cells. So I don't know how clear it is, but this is kind of a pictorial example of a bunch of gradient vectors in a zoomed-in part of the image. So uh, I don't think this was based on any particular image. I just picked random arrows. But this is just a description of how much the color is changing as x and y change at each pixel. And what we do is we kind of gather them together into um, a, a histogram, basically, of those directions. So you kind of count up how much each of those vectors is contributing in each direction. And then it sort of forms a big vector for it. Um, we kind of chunk it up into specific orientations here. The, um, the example I'm using here and the one used in the paper is just eight orientations, so one of the cardinal directions or the diagonals between them. You can use more or less, but using more means that you have bigger features and therefore you have more data to deal with. And we want to keep these small, and it turns out that eight directions is enough to be pretty good at actually describing a location in the image. Um, and then that's basically it. You just take your numbers associated with this, so the weight that kind of fell into each of the directions, and combine them together into a big, long vector. In the case of SIFT, they use four cells with four pixels each and eight directions in each, and so you get 128 uh, element vector of just real numbers, and that describes that location on the image fairly well. So once you have a big vector like that, all that remains in this is to match it against other vectors. So really all you need to do is just do a nearest neighbor search in some kind of a lookup structure. Um, so the example that the paper uses is a modified KD tree. Um, if you're familiar with KD trees, they're a tree, but for multi-dimensional searching. Um, it's just an optimization for optimized for nearest neighbor queries. But the point is that you basically get uh, logarithmic search time for a large data set of vectors, basically. And that's really all you need to be able to compare one key point to another and say, are these the same or are these different? Or I shouldn't say the same. Are these similar or are these unsimilar? because they may not actually be the same object in the image, but as long as they match there, we're kind of confident that we're on the right track. So that was kind of the first part, which was building our database of features and making them quickly searchable. And then the second part of that is just kind of trying to figure out if we can find an object in the image. Um, so as I was alluding to, if you match one feature to another, it's not necessarily going to give you a good idea that that is exactly what you're looking at. You usually need a lot of consensus over multiple features before you can make a good decision on this. Um, in particular, some of the features of the object might have been missing, so you don't want to need too many of them. Um, and you also want it to be kind of robust and deal with the case where some things might have been mismatched or incorrectly matched. Uh, so we need some kind of a method to from a small number of samples, identify if we have a good cluster match in our image. Um, and there's different ways of doing this. Uh, these are out of order. Sorry. Um, right, okay, so each feature has, 
as I said before, each feature had four degrees of freedom in it. It had its position, its rotation, and its scale. And so as a result, if you were to match one feature to another, but they're at, say, a different location, scale, and um, rotation, you can sort of guess that the object was changed in a similar manner in the new image. So that actually implies a pose or a transformation for a target object. And the idea is that if we can match multiple features from one image to the other that have a similar or the same transformation that shifted it over into its new position, we're kind of more confident that that is actually the object we're looking at. Um, so really the question is, how do we identify that pose, that transformation, that change from our template object to its representation in the scene? Um, and because there's a number of different ways that you can transform an object, you could transform it however many different positions or rotations you want. So we want to be able to quickly identify the sort of feasible set of possible transformations. Uh, there's a number of different ways to do this. The one that the paper uses is something called the Ho transform. Um, and it's a fairly general method to detect a simple parameterized shape amongst a set of usually points in an image or even in 3D space. Um, you can use it to detect like cylinders if you have a three-dimensional point set, for example. Um, it's a really useful system, and uh, kind of a simple example of how one would use this would be to identify if a set of points form a circle. Um, so if you think about it, every possible circle in 2D space can be parameterized by its location and its radius. Um, and our question is, given a set of points in R2, do they form a circle? And we'll kind of make things a little bit easier on ourselves by bringing this from a three-dimensional to a two-dimensional problem and say we know what the radius of a circle is going to be if there is one. And so how Ho transform works is it basically just kind of exhaustively considers every possible circle through every possible point. And it seems kind of brute forcey, but it actually works out fairly well. Um, so if you can imagine here, this is a uh, depiction, kind of a spirograph of every possible circle that passes through the top point in the image. Um, but we wouldn't represent it as that. We'd represent it as the centers of all of those circles that are potential candidates that would include that boundary point. And then we repeat it for all of the boundary points, um, every possible circle over every possible boundary point. And we accomplish this by basically just drawing those circles in the image with a certain identifier. And the answer to the question, what circle, if any, are these points on, is kind of going to be at the intersection of a good chunk of these circles, right? Um, you can perform the same thing that a GPS would, trilaterate the position and identify a potential candidate where multiple circles intersect. And the key part about this method is it usually only needs a small number of points to vote on a good position to get you a consensus. Um, so yeah, basically you just sort of create an image of possibilities, although you don't usually use an image, you usually use a sparse structure like a hash table of some sort, um, possibly weighted by the certainty that each of those points is contributing to the object that it thinks it belongs to. And um, the location with the highest number of votes by this method is the one that we guess is the true model of the object that we're looking for. So that was an example in two dimensions. In our case, like I said, our pose is going to be formed out of four parameters, the position, the scale, and the, rot and the orientation, the rotation. Um, a real object actually has six degrees of freedom, but usually four is enough for the purpose of image matching. Uh, so basically what we're going to do is we're going to build that kind of a four-dimensional voting grid matrix thing, and then each of the transformed points that we matched will vote for the transform that it thinks the object has undergone. And um, it seems like it's going to be fairly computationally expensive to do it because obviously positions are infinite, so you'd have to discretize it, and so the question is how much do you need to split up your space, but as it turns out for SIFT, the, you only need a very rough estimate of what it is, so you can usually actually make very large bin sizes for each position, for each rotation, and for each scale location, and um, 
yeah, the specifics are like about 30 degrees of granularity, so you would actually only guess, you would only uh, take each orientation for once every 30 degrees. Um, yeah, and so it's not a lot of effort, but what this does is it very quickly narrows down the number of possible orientations to usually a fairly small, almost constant number for a given set of feature, matched feature points. And the important part here is that we only need rough consensus. Uh, we can do a fine-grained evaluation in our next step. We just want to do this to speed things up as much as possible. Uh, so in our next step, basically once we have an estimate, we can refine it using your favorite refining method, some kind of a least squares optimization, uh, conjugate gradient, you can use some kind of uh, decomposition of a matrix, you can use nonlinear solvers to do this. There, there are many different ways of doing this kind of uh, model optimization once you have a decent guess. And this is the expensive part of trying to find it, but we only do that uh, a small number of times compared to everything else we did in the algorithm for matching it. And once we've solved that, we can uh, kind of gather together as much information as we can and then keep iterating over and over again. It, this is the part of the algorithm that gets kind of nitty gritty and you kind of just guess how many times you need to keep repeating the process over and over until you have a decent match. And so sort of the more you do it, the more sure you are that yes, this is the object we're looking at. Um, so it's not really that important that you understand the nitty gritty of this. It's just standard for most problems in this domain where you need to solve for a model. Um, and then the final decision uses some kind of statistical probability method. Again, it's not very interesting, I think, because it kind of gets away from the image processing part. This is sort of the general sciencey part that almost any kind of um, problem in this kind of recognizing information from nature domain will happen. So I'm not really going to go into details about that. Uh, so yeah, that's basically an overview of image processing and the methods which apply to David Lowe's SIFT paper. So we covered image processing, why we do it and how, roughly. Feature detection, um, identifying, describing, and searching for good points in an image, and then using them in a way to identify objects in the scene. And yeah, that's all I got. For the object uh, feature recognition um, stage, is any normalization done? Because uh, the, the way the bin sort works, as long as it's close, then it's okay? Or do you, does it normalize in any direct any regard? And, and can you repeat the question for the camera? <laughs> Certainly. Um, he's asking if there's any normalization applied to the... Either in the, the vector generation maps? Um, in, in the or, vector generation maps, they do apply normalization. That's okay. standard for that kind of a circumstance. Okay. I, I, I tried to focus on the image processing part since that's the yeah. part that's interesting to me. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure if they were, I guess, normalizing for color variances. So if, if I showed you a black cap and a red cap, but it finds interesting features that are cap, does it, does it say I can find a cap or it just finds black caps or black caps and yeah. red caps or red caps? Um, yeah, so um, the the normalization that occurs is in the first stage of the algorithm when you're doing the key matching. And yes, it does take into account the range, uh, like the range of gradients that are in the image and normalizes it to that, such that if you're under low illumination, obviously you're gonna have a lot smaller range versus high contrast and so on. So normalization is applied there. Um, I, in the second part, I don't think they worry. It's just, as long as it's a rough match, you can solve for it pretty quick, quickly. How did your nephew Lucas help you? <laughs> he was the uh, toddler in the image, uh, identifying something on the screen. It's surprisingly hard to get kids to do something that they do normally. Like I, I, I just saw him running around the house, like pointing at pictures, saying, "That's mommy," and I'm like, "Yeah, that's mommy." Twenty years ago, it's amazing that you can identify that. <laughs> yes. Do you know of <clears throat> any systems that actually use multiple? Uh, multiple iterations of the first part of that whole thing. Like the feature, uh, okay, I think these features match. And instead of doing the really expensive bit of actually matching the models, 
going back and saying, okay, now if I do a whole bunch of modifications, take figure out what that transformation was, go back to the original image and do a whole bunch more iterations on the feature set. Do you know of any systems that do that? Because it seems as though that might be a little bit more efficient, but I don't know. I'm All right. So yeah, the question was, are there systems that kind of do multiple passes of the key point identification um, in such a way as to get better results or get to good results faster? Ideally not have to do the second bit of matching the model. Yeah, I, not, ideally yeah. doing so to get really good matches initially so that the expensive model verification at the end yeah. only needs to be done like once for all, just to be sure. Uh, and to answer that question, I don't know. I It sounds perfectly reasonable. My question though is that usually when you do the first part, you do it once on the image and then store it as a database because it is actually a fairly expensive process to do the whole scale space expansion because it, if you think about it, you're taking that image, which is already pretty big, and you're creating a whole other extra dimension of it. So it's a lot of data to deal with. Um, so I'm not sure if maybe like if you were to like localize and only process that part of the image over again, it might work, but I don't know of anything specific that does that. So it sounds reasonable, but I don't know. Yeah, thanks. Do you use this sort of stuff in your current employment? <laughs> I'm. S uh, <laughs> do I use this stuff in my current employment? I'm supposed to be using this in my current employment. Unfortunately, when I was employed, I didn't realize how much of it I would need to be using. And part of why I am giving this talk is because I it forced me to learn more about it so I can be more effective at my job. <laughs> Yeah, in, in particular, we're doing a lot of stuff with point set manipulation. So uh, that's why the Ho transform in particular was super interesting to me because you can identify if something's a ball just from a set of points. How cool is that? How many points has to be in the set in order to identify if it's a ball? Uh, so how many points are needed for Ho transform consensus? Uh, it depends on the specific thing you're modeling with Ho Transform because Ho Transform is just anything that has a parametric representation can be identified through Ho Transform. So, like the first example of it was just finding lines in an image from a set of points. And so that was just a two dimensional thing, and you just transform it into a weird line space. And then um, there are some really interesting animations I saw at one point where it kind of shows the trace of all the different potential lines that these points form, and they kind of form like curves through the image, and where a decent number of the curves intersected, we can guess it's a line. And usually you only need a couple of them to give consensus. Like usually you can assume that if you have like three or four intersections, then that isn't just a random occurrence. Um, I'm sorry, um, when you say you guess if it's a line, does that mean like there's a certain percentage that is a line? <laughs> a certain percentage? Uh, so, do you just mean? Uh, does anyone have any markers? Some Preferably <laughs> erasable markers? <laughs> it's usually some of the parts of the podium that I'm not sure. Are those the Sharpies? Permanent. Permanent. Dry erase. All right. I've made this mistake way too many times to do it again. Um, so it's dry. Yeah, that's why I decided to put There's three more. All right. I don't know how visible this is, but maybe. Okay, so it, let's imagine that this is our image space and this is our set of points here. Yeah. But let's start with just one point. That one point could possibly be any number of lines. You could have a line going through it this way, you could go through this way, any number right. of possible lines, right? So what the Ho transform does is it basically transforms that to a space where um, the x and y coordinates represent different possible lines. Um, and there's a specific way that they do it so that you can represent all possible lines in two parameters. Um, but basically, it's going to look something like this for that point there, like that. And then the next one will go through, and it'll be another set of possible lines here. 
And so we know, for example, that this is the line through the two of them. That is the one possible line. And as it turns out in the Ho transform, this intersection point here will represent that line. Then furthermore, once you get more points um, in the image, uh, hopefully lining up somewhere along that line, those other points, if they lie on that line, will also go through that same point. But of course, they'll also intersect maybe somewhere else with another thing. If, actually, there's like one line that can go through that one. But basically, you, you get like, once you have three points, the, the intersection of those three on the Ho transform represents the unique line that goes through those three points, if there is one. And so, for the case of lines, once you have three points that are collinear, you can be relatively certain right there that that is definitely a line made out of those points. Um, now, of course, if you have you know, a whole bunch of other points on this side of the image that do form a line here, you'll have a much higher concentration of that line representation. So it all depends on the number of points in the set that you're testing on. But usually it's fairly straightforward to detect if there even is a common line, because if it's just random points spread out everywhere. Um, in, in computational geometry, we have a term called general position, where we say that um, it's when uh, no property of the set will be changed if you move any one point a tiny epsilon. And one of the things we can assume for it is that there is no line that would go through any more than two points in the set. So if there are lines that go through more than two points, we can be reasonably certain that that is an actual line that's supposed to be there under normal circumstances. So that, that's kind of why it works. Maybe it makes sense? Yeah, yeah, it did. It, 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 it. Thank you. So with, I'm assuming you would just simply up the dimensions for your comparison. If you wanted to do three or four take n dimensions, you just your comparison would just be in that dimension of space. Yeah. So the idea with the Ho transform is that yeah, um, the dimension, the number of dimensions in your kind of grid that you're applying your votes towards is just equal to the number of dimensions that your parameterization of the object has. Okay. Um, and yeah, you can do it for any number of dimensions. It's just it takes longer because you have more degrees. Yeah, but that, that's all it is. It's you can represent anything that you can represent as a mathematical equation. Oh, it's gone. Okay, let's thank our speaker again.